Have you ever wondered what truly drives human behaviour and how that impacts things like motivation in the workplace? Why do some leaders seem to effortlessly inspire whilst others struggle to connect at all? Well, today we're going to be delving into the captivating realm of leadership and neuroscience. Joining us today to help me dive into a quite complex subject is Karen Brown, visionary leadership expert, executive coach, and the dynamic CEO of Exponential Results. Karen has spent years deciphering the intricate interplay of self-awareness, human behavior, neuroscience, and the science behind the brain. And in this episode, she guides us through the profound insights that can transform your leadership journey. So we'll be unlocking some more secrets of leadership. We'll be talking about self-awareness and exploring that enigmatic world of human behavior and motivation as Karen helps us delve into the fascinating science that underlies leadership. So this is a journey that promises to revolutionize your understanding of leadership, maybe even some of your relationships at work. So stay with us. It's going to be a really good episode. This is Leading with Integrity Leadership Talk, the podcast for first-time managers who are working in tech-driven businesses and teams and who want to be more effective people-first leaders. Each week, you will learn the crucial strategies, mindsets, and practical tips that successful modern leaders follow to be engaging, ethical, and authentic managers who get the best from their teams. And we'll achieve all of this via weekly conversations with leaders, with leadership experts, entrepreneurs, and business owners, people who have already walked this path and have some amazing insights to share. With an added sprinkling of occasional solo episodes and some group chats where we'll have multiple guests. My name is David Hatch and I will be your host. And leadership has always been a passion for me. After a career spent in a series of small businesses during 15 years in the aerospace industry, five or six of those at the end of that career were in a space startup in the UK. So trying to launch satellites into orbit, very cool stuff. And through all of that experience, I learned that the secret to successful management is in the ability to apply great leadership. And in turn, the secret to great leadership, it's all about your integrity, putting people before profits. the Leading with Integrity podcast. Leadership talk for the modern manager. With your host, David Hatch. Aaron, thank you for joining me today, this morning for you. And to kick us off, I'm going to hand over the reins to you to introduce yourself, tell the listeners a bit about your background, about what you get up to today and and why you do what you do. Oh boy. All right. Let's jump right in. Absolutely. Really excited to be here, David. Thanks for inviting me on. Uh, so gosh, uh, around 30 years ago, uh, I was an aspiring leader. Uh, I was promoted to my highest level of incompetence, as we used to say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it was actually truthful because uh, I, up until then, had been a manager and then, uh, and that's to say more of an individual contributor, uh, a high performer, and then was promoted into a leadership position where I was leading a team. I was leading others. And I had no earthly idea what to do, David. <laughs> and back then, this is almost 30 years ago. That's a long time ago. Uh, back then, there was no like leadership 101 or here's how you are a leader. Here's how to do it. Uh, we didn't have your show back then, which we very much needed. <laughs> so I didn't know what to do. And what I came up with, what I did do was, uh, I, I was naturally curious about human behavior. Uh, I'm now completely fascinated with it and an expert in it. Uh, and I still have a voracious appetite for it. 
But back then, it was just a budding uh, interest in human behavior. And so I did what came naturally to me, which was to ask team members questions. Uh, what motivates you? What demotivates you? What stops you from doing things or achieving your mission or achieving goals? Uh, what gets you out of bed every morning to come in and work here? And much to my pleasant surprise, it worked. I, I started to see teammates, team members flourish and open up and, and they were empowered. And uh, as long as I was the good blocker and removed impediments from their path, they soared and they really excelled. And so I took a step back and thought, all right, what is it exactly that I'm doing? Why is it successful? Then through research and educating myself, I realized that I was coaching them. And then I thought, ooh, I really like this. I want to do more of this. So just kept going with that journey, learning, educating, getting formal uh, education and credentials along the way. That was a 15-year journey uh, and falling even more in love with it every step of the way and finding uh, more and more tools and systems and processes to use. And then in 2010, I learned about neuroscience. I was exposed to neuroscience in a class where we were talking about how our brains work and that our brains function in behavioral patterns. And they do this to save time and energy, just like our cell phone batteries. And again, I was even more fascinated and really dove in and thought, oh, this is the key to senior leadership development, or just call it leadership development, that is faster, easier, and permanent. Because everything I had seen in that first 20 years or so of realizing I was coaching, then becoming a coach uh, in other companies, and then uh, finally founding my own company 10 years ago, is uh, I, had, I had always seen what I'll call traditional methods of leadership development, which were slow, arduous, white knuckling, and impermanent. Many of them didn't last. And after the coaching engagement was over or the leadership development program finished, there was a lot of backsliding. And I thought, I, uh, I want to find a better way. And once I discovered neuroscience and the power of it, uh, the ease and the speed of it, I thought, ah, this is it. This is the difference maker. And I also saw the exponential results that were gained from using uh, or stepping into your behavioral patterns. Very interesting perspective. And I, one of the things I love about the coaching approach to, to leadership, to management even, it always reminds me of that proverb about teaching a man to fish. If you just tell them how to do it, They've not really learned as much as if you just take the coaching approach, you ask the pointed questions and you lead them down the path to find the solution themselves. Maybe a totally different solution to the one you might have thought of originally, but in a lot of ways, that doesn't matter, does it? Exactly. There's a similar axiom that I use often, and it is a human behavioral truth, if you will, that is... uh humans hardly ever do what someone tells them. They almost always do what they think up. Mm. So a coach is there for uh, a coach or leadership development program uh, is really there as a facilitator, as a catalyst to help people to self-discover their own answers, their own truths. And then they'll use that motivation uh, to move forward on their journey. Yeah, and, and another way of putting it that I really liked, which previous guests actually used to say, a truth told is far less powerful than a truth self-discovered. And again, you know, yes. I think that really wraps it up, doesn't it? 
Tell us more then about your approach. So exponential results and your power pathways method. How can neuroscience make you a better leader? Ah, so it all starts with self-awareness. And I think we'll probably get into that more in the details shortly. Uh, and it's the self-awareness of your behavioral contributions to current outcomes. I saw a great meme this morning that was a t that's a t-shirt that says, well, 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 the consequences to my actions just showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we're talking about. Now, whether you want to call them consequences or outcomes or results, it really doesn't matter. It's all the same kind of thing. But uh, so it starts with self-awareness of our own thoughts and actions and then the results that are produced from them. And then we can sort of pick that apart and tease out the behavioral patterns that we're running uh, that produce those results uh, or even the lack of results uh, that we're seeing or experiencing. I must say, I love a good meme and it's always nice to hear them used for, for good instead of evil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, self awareness is such a huge thing, isn't it? In, in leadership in particular and self development as well. And we were talking before, before we hit the record button about the importance of humility for leadership and staying humble. And I think these are all part of the same concept, really, aren't they? In, in the way that you view yourself, your impact on others, what you need to improve on. I mean, being able to recognize that alone is extremely important. And yet, it's quite a rare skill, I find. Yes, totally agree. Thousand percent. What uh, I'd like to add to that is it's it's the ability to look inward first mm. rather than outward. And I would say that that is how we become self-aware. Uh, I remember uh, the the years when I became, when I finally became self-aware because I was blind for a long time longer than I would have liked to have been. Let's just put it that way. And uh, it was in my probably late 30s, early 40s, when I finally became self-aware and sort of flipped the script from my previous automatic operating system, or so I thought, which was, well, what's going on out here? What's going on outside of me that produced the current result that I'm seeing, the, the current result that maybe I don't like. Flip that to, okay, wait a minute. Look at my own behavior. Look at my own contribution to that. What did I do or say that contributed to that, that maybe was the cause and resulted in the effect that I'm now seeing? That was huge. That was absolutely huge. That was the, the true difference maker, the eye opener for me. Um, and I find that when leaders can do that, when they can make that shift, it is game changing. Absolutely. And in that stage of your career, where, where were you then? What was it that prompted that change of mindset? If you don't mind me asking. I'm so glad you did. <laughs> uh, I was working for the worst boss in the world. Yeah. Uh, my nickname for him at the time was pathetic excuse for a human being. Yeah. It's quite a mouthful, that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was a charmer. <laughs> I tell you what. Yeah. Uh, but I will say I have gratitude for him because it was through that relationship, because it was so painful, that the pain finally got high enough that I flipped into looking at myself looking at my contribution to those situations. And honestly, uh, this is another human truth uh, that I work with a lot that is most often, the majority of the time, humans will take action to avoid pain rather than action to bring pleasure. We think it's the opposite. It's not. If you look, if you examine the most recent things that you've taken the biggest action on, 
I guarantee you they were probably to avoid pain, either current pain that you're in or future pain that's going to come. And with self-awareness, you can actually change that. And with that horrible, horrible boss that I, I pretty much blamed for everything, right? Uh, blamed for my position in the company, my lack of ascension. I mean, you name it. I, I blamed him for it all until I realized, oh, okay, wait, he's, he's actually just the figurehead. Yeah. He's, he's doing some nasty things. That's for sure. But it's how I'm dealing with them. It's how I'm internalizing them. It's my self-talk. It's the words and actions that I'm contributing to these situations that are leading to or producing the results that I'm seeing right now, the experiences that I'm having. That was a, that was a liberating moment. That was the, honestly, I can remember that day like yesterday, crystal clearly. It's funny, isn't it? How sometimes the actions of others can make you reflect on your own. Yes. Yes. I mean, he hearing you tell that story, particularly the start of it, um, <laughs> <laughs> It makes it's, your skin crawl, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it does, but, but because I've been in that position as well, you know, and there's so many people I talk to these days that have all got a, a similar story to that. You know, I've, I've even started, so when I go to a networking meeting, there's a whole room of people. I'll ask at the beginning, hands up if you've had a bad manager experience. And the number of people who put their hands up, it's usually like 90% of the room at least. But then if I ask the other question, which is, the opposite. How many have had a good manager experience? How many of you who you've worked for a really great leader? It's a lot less. It's yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I've only started doing that recently, so it's too early to form a proper robust statistical mm -hmm. sample. But <laughs> anecdotally, yeah. it's usually about half as many. Um, yeah. I mean, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's what this podcast is all about. It's trying to turn that the other way around. Yes, um, absolutely. I'm with you on that mission, a and. Uh, it, it, anecdotally, absolutely accurate. And there's a lot of current statistics that bear that out. I also know that it's often in those same experiences where bad managers can have their eyes open too. It's just, will we, will we stick in there and speak the truth, speak kind truths, which we want to be spoken? Too, right? Um, it's speaking kind truths uh, that will help and, and giving giving feedback, right? We want feedback. They want feedback too, uh, even if maybe it seems like they don't. And it's it's through those mechanisms that we can open eyes and and hold up that mirror that you talked about a second ago. Yeah, it's a really good point, actually, because I think a lot of people in that position, I mean, I know this is what I did, similar to what you've talked about as well. You know, you blame that bad boss for everything. And and going past that, though, usually the gut reaction, the first thing you'll do, or at the first best opportunity anyway, you're going to leave. You're not yeah. going to give that feedback. But actually, yeah. you're absolutely right. You know, you do have a responsibility to at least ask them, you know, boss, are you... Are you receptive to feedback? Can I give you some some thoughts of how this is looking from my perspective? Can we have a discussion about it? Most people yes. aren't going to say no to that question. But if they do, yes. then you know, right, I, I'm making the right decision. I need to leave. <laughs> right. Then you go to HR, you have a conversation well, yeah. with them, and then you leave. And you say yeah. why you left in the exit interview. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But you're right, David, in that it, it is also uh, m the majority of the time, uh, because we are pulling back from perceived danger that we'll just pull back. We'll pull back. We'll avoid. We'll shut down and we'll, we'll move on, right? Whether it's quiet quitting or bare minimum Monday or whatever all of those current trends are, right? Uh, and uh, I'd like to change that. I really would. Um, some of the work that we do, actually a big portion of the work that we do is something called RQ, which stands for relationship intelligence quotient. And, uh, we use an inventory 
And it's called an inventory, not an assessment. It doesn't assess anything against anything else. So it's not like a personality profile. It literally just inventories current behavior. And when we put that up on the wall for team members and teams to see, they're literally astounded. And they go, oh my gosh, that's exactly right. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens in our team dynamic or in our interactions with each other. How, how did you know that? Okay, because it's human behavior and it's behavioral patterns that are getting played out. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens in conflict. So with you and I and everybody else that is experiences this bad boss in conflict, we deploy certain behavioral patterns and usually avoidance, self-protection, uh, those are two of them. But you're absolutely right. We can promulgate a completely different outcome if we can change that behavioral pattern, when we can change that behavioral pattern, because it's fairly easy to do so. You just have to be aware of it and then actively change it, actively step in to conflict and see that it's going to be productive and there's going to be a productive outcome from it. Thanks. Back to the self-awareness piece again, doesn't it? You know, you've got to, mm -hmm. before you can make that active change, you have to recognize what needs changing. Right. So to take that one step further, it's, it's also learning about how we each operate. What are our individual or unique behavioral patterns that we run, that we bring to work, that we bring to professional interactions and relationships? Because we're all at work to get something done, right? And it's becoming aware of sort of our operating system. How do we try to get things done? And once you see that, it's really easy to then see behavioral patterns, where they need to be changed, um, and then also how we can change our interactions. We can improve our interactions with others and honestly be more productive, be happier at work. Uh, everybody be more engaged and uh, elevated in their performance. Thinking about the relationship intelligence, that kind of side of it, it also makes me think from the self-awareness piece and emotional intelligence, what an often overlooked aspect of empathy and emotional intelligence is the ability to self-regulate your own emotions. And when we look at that in the context of the workplace, I mean, that is so, so important, isn't it? Particularly in, when we're looking at cases where there's conflict, where there's relationships in the workplace that aren't working quite right and all of these kind of things, particularly in small businesses, in my experience, um, yeah. where there's fewer places to hide and less people to buffer, shall we say. Yes. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's often overlooked and I think it's, it's so, so important for leaders to be aware of it for themselves, but also spread that as part of the culture so that everyone can do it. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I'm going to put it this way. Uh, I spend a lot of my time working with um, leaders that are in the, let's just say, 45 and above range. And that's, that's way down range. You know, we're, we're working on behavioral patterns that they've deployed for years, maybe decades, maybe multiple roles in multiple companies. And it doesn't need to be that way, right? So this is another reason I was so interested to be on your show because I also think I probably wasted 20 years when I was not self-aware that I could have uh, facilitated much greater change and results and happiness and fulfillment uh, in my work and for team members. Uh, and the audience has the opportunity right now to do that yes indeed and that's one of the reasons why I, I love working with the early career managers the new leads the first timers because i mean there's an aspect of get, getting to have these conversations before those bad habits become yeah. embedded but also i think having been through that journey myself and similar experiences you had as well when you were there there's so much of it where it's it becomes a learned behavior but in a, a more negative way because you just emulate the bad practices of the manager that you've had or the, that had your job before you 
because there's no other context for you. You don't know any better. You're not being given the training. And it's just, that's the way it's done in the company. And so that's, that's another thing that I'm really keen to, to get to grips with and try to change because as you say, it doesn't have to be that way. Exactly. Many of us feel like, uh, these patterns are highly ingrained or they're innate. They're in our DNA. They're part of who we are. And so they can't be changed. That's absolutely untrue. Only 5% of our behavioral patterns are in our DNA, cannot be changed. The other 95% are flexible. This is where we can make new connections in our brains. Uh, that is why I named Power Pathways, which is our system, what I did, because they are literally creating new super highways of success in our brains. It's called neuroplasticity. And we all have this ability uh, our entire lives, no matter what age we are, we still have this neuroplasticity ability to create new neural connections in our brains. And 95% can be changed. Your, your behavior can be changed without you changing who you are. That might be my new favorite statistic. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of listeners are going to think I'm weird for saying that. And my response to that is, don't you have a favorite statistic? I thought everyone did. Anyway, moving on. A, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a statistic about that, isn't there? Anyway, so from your own experiences, I know you do a fair bit of work with, with the big companies, with the Fortune 500 and executives that work in, in those kinds of environments. And talking about as well the behavior behind these things and the behavioral change aspects as well. What would you say are the, the secrets to successful leadership when we look at it from, from that perspective? Lead yourself well before you look to lead others. And let me back up for one quick second. Uh, I tend to prefer the term leader rather than manager because they are two different things. Managers manage things and tasks. Leaders lead people to complete work and projects. So if you're a first time manager, that tells me that you're not yet a leader. You're not yet leading others. You are managing yourself and you're managing a lot of tasks. Okay, great, perfect. So the key then is to manage yourself, lead yourself well first. So first of all, become self-aware by looking at your own behaviors, triggers, uh, and glimmers. So I love that this, this term glimmers is now being used more often uh, because it's sort of the opposite to a trigger, right? A trigger re means we experience a negative emotion um, and then we have to try to manage through it. Um, it. Call it an emotional reaction, if you will. Well, a glimmer is the opposite of that. It's where we experience, uh, because of something somebody did or said or an experience, we feel happiness or joy. So I like to incorporate both of those, triggers and glimmers. And uh, what we help leaders to do is to, first of all, help them become self-aware uh, because when we're working with leaders, we're going to ask you questions that will uh, bring about that self-awareness, that will cultivate it. And then we're also experts at identifying behavioral patterns. Uh, we can ask you a question and from a maybe one or two sentence response, come up with a behavioral pattern that's likely at play there. And then we can sort of take that behavioral pattern out and hold it up in front of us and just look at it. Why does it exist? Where does it come from? Why was it created? Because that's the thing. Every behavioral pattern is created for a reason. I mentioned earlier 
our brains work in behavioral patterns to save energy. Uh, because if you, if you go all the way back to when we were cave people and we had to hunt down our own food every day, uh, and run away or outrun, uh, predators that would like to prey upon us so that we could survive another day, uh, our brain had to develop this sort of operating system of, okay, because our, our energy was finite. We didn't have a lot of energy for every day because we were literally running down our own food. That took a lot of energy. And if you've ever spent a day where you were engaged in completely original thought all day, it's exhausting. By the end of the day, you're, you're like nodding off in front of the computer. You can't eat enough food. You can't consume enough caffeine. Right. Oh, I'll give it and a good try though. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and there's probably going to be a cocktail at the end of that day too. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> There is for me. Uh, so that's the proof of what I'm talking about historically. So that's, that's why our brain developed this use of behavioral patterns. And it, 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 they're developed in our subconscious mind. And remember the subconscious mind and, and I'm going to keep this very, very simple. Okay. Cause it's the subconscious mind has a lot of science to it. And detail, and I'm not going to I'm not going to geek out, at least not yet. Uh, so I'll keep it really simple, which is our subconscious mind is the recorder, right? It records everything that happens, and it has a processing volume and speed that is just a little bit uh, slower than the speed of light, and processes two billion bits of information per second. Now, this is compared to the very pedestrian conscious mind, which processes only about 200 bits of information per second. And at a speed of 100 to 150 miles per hour. So think of it like a skateboard compared to a SpaceX rocket. That's the major difference between our conscious and subconscious mind. So our subconscious mind records everything that happens and it's the one that creates behavioral patterns to save juice. Okay. So that's why we have to become aware of them because we're typically not consciously aware that we're running any kind of pattern. We, we just think, Oh, well, this is just the way I am. This is just how it should be done. Right. But it's our own unique pattern uh, that creates our operating system. And patterns are nothing more than that. They are created by our subconscious mind to get us the result we're looking for at that time. So it's important when we're looking at self-awareness and then we become, of the, become aware of the behavioral pattern, we find out why it was formed. So I'll ask clients often, where does this originate? When did you start running this behavioral pattern and why? And it'll take them a second, but it's amazing because the answer is always in there. It always is. I've not come across one instance yet where it isn't. If you just ruminate on the question, your subconscious brain will come up with it. And then we can sort of take out that behavioral pattern and look at it and go, oh, okay, so what's the current result that it's, it's producing? And what's the result we'd rather have? Okay, then let's change the behavioral pattern to something that aligns or lines up more with creating that desired result instead. Yeah, so it's, it's far more simplistic than even the time it just took me to explain it. It, it reminds me slightly of, of problem solving in an engineering context, actually. Understanding yeah. the process, getting the inputs, the outputs, making them match or achieve what you want rather than what they are. Yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, I mean, you mentioned SpaceX there. So we've got rocket science and brain science in one conversation. So that's picking yeah. the bingo card. Well done. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that about the, the speed 
at which the brain processes that. That's very interesting. Well, it's highly useful when we are relying on ourselves to find a better way, Mm -hmm. right? And the other thing I want to add is successful transition from uh, or into first time leader is um, treat it like a journey, not an event. It is an ongoing journey. I mean, I work with leaders that have been working on improvement and their own growth for multiple years, maybe a couple of decades. Uh, leadership is a big thing. It, it's all encompassing and it's, it's difficult. It's challenging because we're leading human beings and humans are messy. <laughs> yeah, very true. And I, I mean, leadership is also constantly evolving, isn't it? You know, yes. whether because of the circumstance or because we discover a new way of doing something or, or both, you know, so, yeah. you know, I, I think someone who, who sits, sits on their hands almost and says they know everything they need to know about leadership almost doesn't matter at what stage of their career they say that at that point to me, they stop being a leader. Because if you're not constantly looking for more knowledge, for new ways of doing things, for expanding your knowledge, then I think, you know, you know, there's that another one of those axioms, isn't there, about standing still? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. Thousand percent. Uh, and to that point, since it's a journey, it's an ongoing journey, not an event. The other thing I would uh, suggest is create a growth plan for yourself. And follow it. Mm. Keep going. The best leaders I know have an annual growth plan. They're never without one. So might as well incorporate that now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and looking at it from the perspective of a leader as well, once you start doing that for yourself, how much better a leader are you going to be if you then can implement it for your people? Yes. Yes. Bravo. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to move on to one of our big topics for discussion. As interesting as, as this is, and I could, and I'm sure you could talk about it for another hour. Sadly, we haven't at the time. Um, so I'm particularly interested in this one because it's, it's relevant, but also with your perspective from the behavioral sense of it and um, with the work that you do and the neurolinguistic aspects as well. And you've already mentioned a couple of them with, with the great resignation and quiet quitting, bare minimum Monday. I'm not sure I've heard that one, actually. You might have to tell us what it is. Um, <laughs> and then there's this quiet hiring and quiet firing thing as well, which seems to be quite a new one, um, or at least the name is. So what are these workplace trends mean for for the average person for the average manager and what can leaders be doing to make sure we're addressing them in the right ways oh i love that you asked this question uh because most of the time when i hear stuff like this i feel like shouting from the rooftops hey here's what's going on uh so f- first of all it shows that there is a lack of open and clear dialogue about this stuff. People just are not communicating. Either they're not communicating at all or they're not communicating well. So uh, I would say what we can do to address these issues is number one, be open with your leader about how you're feeling and why. Work with them to craft solutions for success for you and the team and the company. And then in parallel, examine the root cause of your own feelings and actions that you're taking on those. Most people don't stop to do that. They just blame the outside forces. Well, I'm not getting what I want at work. I'm unhappy there. I don't feel included or I feel excluded or whatever else is going on. And if they can rectify that situation, then they stop. They don't do sort of the the debrief about, oh, okay, well, what was my contribution to that situation? Maybe I wasn't o- as open as I could have been. Maybe I wasn't open at all. Maybe I was just, you know, kind of 
pulling back and uh, being reserved, crawling into my shell, uh, and hoping that the issue would change, hoping that a solution would just come without me doing anything to bring it. Not going to happen. I think the second solution is leaders then, they must ask better questions to open up the conversation. They've got to make it safe for everyone to share feelings and wishes. So I went to, I attended a conference recently that was excellent. Um, it was with uh, HR professionals, let's just put it that way. And I saw a presentation from a guy named Zach Mercurio, M-E-R-C-U-R-I-O. He's a PhD, which I normally don't speak to, but I'll make an exception for him. He was really good. <laughs> it's a couple of examples that we can utilize. Um, so for leaders to ask better questions, instead of the proverbial, how are you? Ask, what has your attention right now? What kind of day have you had? What do you need help with today? And how can I help specifically? What's been most meaningful for you today? And why? Then, this other practice I really like, uh, it's called authentic check-ins. And do use the stoplight metaphor, which is green, yellow, and red. So, and, and you can use this in meetings or check-ins or even on the fly, where you ask, hey, what's going on for you? Where are you? You can say, oh, I'm green today, which means I feel safe, passionate, content, perhaps in the flow. I'm able to be present, engage, create, and learn. Yellow means I can be present, but may be reactionary. I may feel overwhelmed or frustrated about something, or my attention may be pulled in another direction. Red means I'm overloaded, maybe overwhelmed, stressed, burned out, reactive, or feel it's difficult to be fully present. I think we as first time leaders, or if we're managers and we're trying to make that jump, we're trying to uh, lead ourselves well, then we need to practice these authentic check-ins with ourselves first and then voice them authentically to those we are working with, maybe to our leader. There's so much great advice in there. Um, I think one thing that stands out to me particularly, I mean, we, most of us have probably heard of this this idea of helicopter parenting, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've seen helicopter managers Right. So they just, they'll fly in. They'll ask like the surface level, superficial question. How are you? Yeah. And then they won't really listen to the answer and then they'll flip off again and you won't see them for the rest of the week. And that's yeah. why I, I love what you said there about the, the questioning technique, the importance of being specific in terms of what people actually need from you and taking the time. So if it's in an office environment, say instead of just sort of standing over them like the helicopter asking the question and running away, Sit down, have a cup of coffee or tea in your hand, yeah. make them feel like you're there to have the conversation and yes. you're actually listening to what they say. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I can't applaud that enough. That is spot on. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I love what you said. Uh, then it is uh, inherent upon leaders to actually sit still and listen to what your people are telling you. Because I, I also find this a lot too. Uh, someone leaves the organization. It's a surprise to everyone. Most of all, the leader. Why? And I question my leaders hard about that kind of thing. I say, you definitely should have known about this. Now let's, let's uncover why you didn't know. And this always comes up. Mm. Oh yeah, I'm on the fly. You know, they seemed all good. I said, were they really? No. I said, did you feel that? Did you have an inkling about that? Yes. Why didn't you ask? Because I was in a hurry. Yeah. yeah. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, yep. definitely. It's um, up to us 
to open up eyes, open up ears. Exactly, exactly. And I think that that goes so far towards explaining things like maybe the Great Resignation is, I'm sure it's a lot more complicated than that, but certainly things like quiet quitting. Like if, if people feel heard and valued and listened to, then they're not going to be doing that sort of thing, in my opinion. But exactly. maybe that's a, a longer conversation for another time. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just add this one other thing. This is also from Zach. Very, very good. It's an acronym. And his overall presentation was about mattering, M-A-T-T-E-R-I-N-G, that this is going to be the quintessential skill um, to success in the next 10 years in the workplace. Because in the next 10 years, we will have five generations all coming together, working in uh, the workplace at the same time. So it's uh, paramount uh, importance for us to figure out how to work together effectively. And what he's come up with is this acronym NAN, N-A-N, which stands for noticed when people feel seen and heard. It's what you just said, David. People mm -hmm. have to feel seen and heard. Then A is affirmed. People see how their unique strengths make a unique difference. And as leaders, uh, we have to be able to see those things and articulate them to our team members. And as managers, uh, it's up to us to identify those. And sometimes we have to put those in front of our leader. That's okay. And then the last N is needed. People feel relied on, indispensable, and essential. So when you, when you say to someone or you send an email that starts with, if it weren't for you, that conveys how they are needed. They are indispensable and they are essential. That, that is inherent in all of us feeling fulfilled, seen, heard at work and feeling valuable there. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to be looking this guy up, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> uh -huh. He should be on your show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, hopefully. We'll see. So much about that, uh, particularly in, in the affirming piece. You know, there's, there is that aspect, isn't there, where if a leader is not doing that, if they don't know the answers to these questions, if they don't know how their people are feeling, I think they're just not doing their job. You know, I think there's a lot of leader managers out there and a lot of cultures and organizations where it's, it's more of a kind of, I say, jump, you say, how high kind of dynamic. And it's yeah. not seen as, as their job to do anything beyond that. They, they're there for the outputs, for the results, for the, the dollar signs, the pound signs, whatever. And it's not about the people so much, but. I just think that is so wrong. I mean, morally, I think it's wrong, but also it's no way to run a business. I don't think you're going to succeed in the long term either. And ultimately, if you are worried about the bottom line, the best way to improve it is to value your people because then they perform better. <laughs> yes. You know, any way you look at it, it makes no sense to me. But Yes. Yeah. Off the I, I agree with you <laughs> that, uh, yeah, they are not doing their job if that's what they're doing. Yeah. yeah. Every yeah. in my book, everything rises and falls on leadership. Agree. Yeah. So we can we can lay it all at leaders' feet. Yes. Yeah. Not to scapegoat them, but you know, it is the job. Right. There we go. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you could start your career over again, would you do anything differently? Yes. It's what I said earlier. Uh I would have cultivated self awareness. Uh, 20 years before I did. Yeah. Uh, and then I would be fully transparent, fully authentic, share my thoughts, uh, and be fully present. Yeah. That's definitely what I would do over again if I could do anything differently. Cool. Good. That was an easy answer then. Good. Leadership Heroes. Now onto the more difficult question. And this is one of my favorite questions, actually, which is why every single guest is asked this same question. So uh, it's called Leadership Heroes. 
Mm -hmm. The question is, if you had to pick one person, they can be alive or dead, past, present, you know, from anywhere in human history. You could even be real or fictitious, if you like, who, in your opinion, would perfectly embody leadership. Who would that person be and why? Oh, I love this question. So first of all, I, I tackle it from the perspective that I, I don't want to name someone uh, just based on what I see of their leadership from the outside. I feel like the best person to name are leader, leadership heroes that I actually got to interact with every day or do interact with every day. And I really get to see you know, sort of the the brass tacks of their true leadership in action. And there's honestly very few leaders uh, that I've had that that experience with. So uh, the person that I like to name is Gary Keller. He is, for those that don't know, he uh, is the founder and CEO of Keller Williams Realty International which is a $270 billion global real estate organization. Uh, He built it from the ground up. He's a self-made man. Uh, I got to see his leadership in action up close and personal a lot. Uh, And I also liked his number two, Mark Willis, Uh, because Gary is very, he's very direct. He speaks kind truths. And, and maybe they're a little less kind than you'd like sometimes because they're very direct. Um, but Mark Willis, uh, the reason that I name him is because as the president of this huge organization, uh, he was, I think, giving a, a state of the company report one time. And he gave everybody in the audience, which was 5,000 people, he gave everyone a book by Gary Zukov, which was about personal power, personal improvement. And I was stunned. And, and he talked about what this book meant to him and how he used it for personal improvement. And I was just stunned by that because I thought, wow, this is an authentic leader. This is someone who is completely present, uh, They are working on themselves all the time. Uh, They're looking to be the best version of themselves. They're looking inward first, and they're also looking to help others, bringing others along. And I I just, again, I was blown away. I still have that book, and it's still one of my favorites. That's an incredible story, actually. And it it, it aligns so well with everything we've been talking about today as well, doesn't it? It's just literally that in practice. Yeah. Um, love that. Yeah. Always really like the examples of where people choose a hero that they've actually met and had the opportunity to work with. Cause I agree with you. It's especially historical figures. Like it's so easy to pick a name like, I don't know, Julius Caesar or Winston Churchill. And, but none of us really know what they were like anymore. They're, they're out of living memory now, sadly. Right. Um, so yeah, really like that example. Lovely. Thank you. Well, Karen, it's been so nice talking with you today. Um, Pleased we've agreed on so much. For the last last couple of minutes, um, if the listeners would like to learn more about you, get in touch, maybe work with you, would you like to point towards a website, a book, podcast, all of the above? Yes, absolutely. Uh, So you can find me on my website, which is yourexponentialresults.com. That's spelled Y-O-U-R, exponential results.com and you can also find me um, on LinkedIn Karen Brown and just search Karen Brown exponential results and I'll pop right up great and I'll put the links to that in the episode description as well so everyone can find it easily well that was it and we've almost finished on time so thank you again so much have a great rest of your day look at that thank you David such a pleasure likewise thanks Karen Cheers, everyone. If you have encountered challenges as a new leader, if you are a first-time manager, I'm here to help you with your leadership journey. Visit www.leadernotaboss.com to access a wealth of resources on that subject. 
But more than that, I invite you to schedule a free, no obligation chat with me. You'll find a button to do so on that website that I just gave you. Let's discuss your leadership journey and explore how I can guide you in the right direction. Karen, thank you for your valuable insights today. Your generosity in sharing those experiences is truly appreciated, not just by me, I'm sure by the listeners as well. Listeners, you can find additional information about Karen, including how to contact her in the episode notes, the the episode description. So be sure to click on some of those things and explore those links for more. And that's a wrap for today. Just want to express again my gratitude to all of you listening, especially those of you who have left reviews and feedback. Your support really does mean the world to me and it enables us to keep going with this podcast. And I look forward to having you back next week when I'll be sitting down with another executive coach, Eric Nelich, to talk about his experiences working for startups, small companies and big tech companies and the leadership lessons that he was able to glean from that experience, as well as his work today as an executive coach and so much more besides. So another one not to miss. I will talk to you then. And in the meantime, as always, remember, be a leader not a boss.